Magic is found in every room where people connect over a shared purpose. In this weekly podcast, Luke, Hannah and Chris explore the role of purpose, courage, mindset and culture in every leader's quest for transformational performance. Hello and welcome to Magic in the Room. I am Hannah Broderud. And I'm Luke Freeman. And today we are just honored and excited to have uh, James Beal and Brittany Francis here with us. We are all in San Antonio, Texas, which is where none of us live. So that's kind of fun. <laughs> so we're intersecting here at the National Native American Human Resources Association Annual Conference. I think it's been kind of a hit. They sold it out. So yep. uh, there's like 560, 580 attendees. We're all down here at the Riverwalk. Like the evening events have been fun. So Too fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so you guys uh, presented a session here. And when we saw it on the agenda, we were just like, let's, we need to like talk about that because yeah. it's something near and dear to our hearts. But like hearing your perspective and how it's played out in your organization will be really cool. So, and your lives, yeah, I would say. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that is having a best friend at work. Mm -hmm. What what does that mean? And so we'll dig into all of that, but I'll stop talking. So James, Brittany, tell us a little bit about your role, where you work, what you do, and then let's do kind of a get to know you too. Like what is your favorite part of your job? And Hannah and I will answer as well. All right. Okay. okay. James, you want to start us out? Sure. Okay. First off, just it's an honor to be here. Thanks for having us on here. This is my first go around with Nahara's conference, uh, and it's just it's really fun to be around like minded people and mm -hmm. um, see people with similar yeah challenges, successes, and all that good stuff. So uh, my name is James Beal. I'm the director of leadership and talent development for the Kalispo Tribe of Indians and Northern Quest. Uh, it's located in Spokane, Washington. Uh, we operate a resort and casino and a handful of enterprises. Um, and it's, uh, it's a blast every day. I got something different to do. Um, I've worked with the tribe for about 12 years now. Uh, it'll be 13 in December. And it's, uh, yeah, just something special, something you can't get anywhere else. Uh, my favorite thing about my role and getting to work with my best friend uh, to start, I suppose, is uh, the opportunity to make an impact on on a, a large family, a tribe, uh, and a community, just the people that come and work for the tribe, um, all have different stories and backgrounds, and to get to be a part of those with them is, is something, again, you can't get anywhere else. Yeah, very cool. Brittany, how about you? <laughs> Uh, Brittany Francis, Director of Talent Acquisition, been with Cowspell Tribe for 12 years. Um, I love understanding people and, um, you know, similar to what we talked about a little bit earlier, psychology behind people. And so offering people opportunity jobs is the coolest job ever, mm -hmm. uh, hands down, in my opinion. And so I, I always say I have the best job in the entire organization and just love what I do and like James said, get to spend day in, day out with him and his team and collaborating. And it's, it's a good time. Yeah. And what's your favorite thing? Just hiring people yeah, and getting to know people. people. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's, it, it's unreal. The life changing moments where you get to see, here's this piece of paper that I'm handing you and, and you now get to work for this wonderful employer. It's just really rewarding. How about you, Luke? All right. What's for me, my favorite <laughs> part of my job, um, I think, so you guys both kind of touched on this, but there's something special about working with leaders who are seeing something besides like financial return as an outcome. And so whenever I get to be in a room with folks who they're all really in it for something that's bigger, uh, more lasting, more generational impact. And that happens in our you know, Native American enterprise clients, um, similar to where you guys are working. It happens also in like privately held oftentimes organizations where maybe it's a family business, maybe it's a founder or an owner who's saying, okay, I've brought this to this spot, but I really want it to last. And I think it can be something really amazing in the lives of people, but I, I'm not going to be doing it 10 years from now. So how do we do that? How do we make that real? How do we leverage this desire to, uh, make a difference and build communities that really are thriving. And so being in rooms with those people and working through strategies for how to do it and, and then seeing, seeing it happen. Like, yeah, that's my favorite part. Maybe yeah. that's too broad. I don't know. I like it. So it comes to mind. Hannah. 
Yeah, it's interesting because as I've heard each of you kind of sharing your why and your favorite part of the work that you do, I was like, yes, I agree with you, Brittany. <laughs> yes, James, that's my favorite part. And Luke, I was like, yes, that's my favorite part. <laughs> um, so I would say all of the above. For me, it really goes back to, um, you know, we talk about purpose here a lot. And for me, I believe that there is something great in every human being. And so to be able to to look for the light, in which way is this person intelligent? In which way is this person beautiful? In which way can this person contribute? And to try to find that and connect with it and help to bring that forward, when I get to do that, that's what, what lights me up when I feel like I'm... Um, being able to fulfill my purpose in that way, that really makes uh, my work really worth it. And so I would say that can look like a lot of different things in a lot of different ways on a lot of different days, but that really is what it comes back to. That's my favorite part of my work. I love it. I like it. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. great. Very cool. Okay, so before we jump into finding a best friend at work, the impact that has on culture and also on the performance of the organization, which I think, mm -hmm. you know, is important as well. I'd love to hear just a little bit more of your stories. So what, what are some formative moments in your leadership journey? Maybe like, hey, my first job was this and I really learned this or, you know, there's this one time I really faced this challenge. But when you think about getting to these roles that you're in now, what's the story? How did you get here? Why are you doing what you're doing today? You, you said we only have like... <laughs> 45 minutes. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. You get two make, I, we, hey, you know, when things get crazy, we just make it two episodes. I love it. Uh, so part one will be James. Part two will be Brittany because I could feel that whole time. Uh, man, wild ride is how I would describe my my journey with, with the tribe. Uh, it, on paper, if you were to pull me up like on a profile and like a HR system, you would see changes in job and opportunities every every couple of years and yeah. I attribute a lot of that to uh, relationships and good mentors and just uh, um, just putting in work that uh, has allowed me to be visible in in the right areas and um, I've really enjoyed all of the relationships that have got me to where I'm at um, just a lot of really great strong partnerships and uh, you know so as I shared, Brittany and I have worked together in the casino for 12 years, uh, but have only been uh, colleagues for five years when we first started, like having shared meetings and then the opportunity to work together. Um, you know, so it, it's it's that kind of thing. Like she's always been right there and I've always been on the other side of the casino or somewhere else, but um, that our, our paths crossed eventually and mm -hmm. allowed us to do um, really good good work together and uh, I don't I don't think we could have written it like it's it's just uh, it's very unique and um, I wish more people had that opportunity which is I think part of some of the underlying reason like we wanted to have this conversation and share this information because um, there's some unfortunate stats around people having friends at work and mm -hmm. it's not as big of a thing as I think it, it could be yeah mm. yeah and what's your before we move on to Brittany what's your personal purpose what's your why what's that thing that gets you out of Bed. I, don't, I don't know if you've put words to that yet, but um, what's that purpose statement if you have it? Uh, so you've hit me at a great time because I just came from this really amazing <laughs> retreat this last <laughs> weekend before this, and uh, that completely broke me. Um, but <laughs> I, I would... I would say professionally and personally, um, I would say adventures into like what I want to do with my family and my children. But uh, my why is to create as many light bulb moments as I can for the people around me. And wow. I define a, a light bulb moment as uh, not me telling somebody something. So now they have new information, but mm -hmm. for me to share a perspective or insight that then that then triggers that for themselves is like, oh, my gosh, I get it now. Um, I, I live for those moments and it, it gives me goosebumps when I can see it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I want to do that with my my friends and my family as well. So it's a personal vision for me also. But uh, yeah, light bulb moments is is my why. I love it. Yeah, Very that's cool. beautiful. That's awesome. All right. What's your story? What have been those <laughs> kind of, you know, crux, the cruxes of your journey? Uh, but hold on. Yes. What's Brittany's <laughs> purpose and why? Well, yeah, you can do that first if you want. <laughs> yeah. That works. Okay. <laughs> Uh, barista by trade and by yeah. heart, uh, first job and 
just really helped me understand that I love, I love connection. Mm -hmm. I love this type of connection. I'm not much of a group person, but Mm -hmm. the one-on-one ability to take things that you tell me and then turn around and make you feel special and acknowledge them purpose very much so. Right. Mm -hmm. And I just happened to have two very awesome mentors that really saw my light and took Mm -hmm. that and developed it and just helped me kind of have a transition into people in the people world. So here we are. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you. I love hearing that (laughs) because that's my word. Light. (laughs) I love it. Yeah. 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 Well, and I think if I'm a listener right now, you know, what I would want people to really hear is when you have such clarity about your individual purpose, like there is a level of, I know if I did that today or not. Mm -hmm. So when I hear something like create as many light bulb moments for people, oh, and here's how I define a light bulb moment. Um, then I'm like, well, I think you know you did that at the end of the day or Mm -hmm. not. Mm -hmm. And that level of clarity and that level of even feedback for yourself to reflect on, you know, if you don't have that as a leader, I think it's job number one, Mm -hmm. right? That's the, that's the thing to figure out. And, oh, you know, is this the right career for me? Is this job opportunity the right one for me? All of these things that we wrestle with, like, hey, do job number one. Let's get clear about your personal purpose, that North star for you. And, um, yeah, thank you all for being great examples of (laughs) people who have done the work, right? (laughs) You've done it and there's amazing benefits to doing it. So, okay. Topic for the day, having a best friend at work. So tell me, you, you mentioned a little bit, you guys have a personal story here about being besties at work. So like, give us a little bit of insight into that. Um, how did that develop? How did how does, it start? Right. How, how, what does that look like day to day? Sure. Uh, I mean, I'll start. Do I guess. it. <laughs> Do it. Uh, we were part of a culture club. Okay. Uh, a mutual friend of ours that um, knew both of us very well mm-hmm. created this culture club to talk about how we could better our organization and help people feel the things that we were feeling mm-hmm. on a larger scale. And so. Um, at the time I worked for our KDEV, which is, was separate at the time. And we were getting ready to break out and have our own HR department. And my boss saw, I think our connection and how well we intertwined. And he said, I'm, I'm going to post this position for leadership and and an employment manager. And I want you to be the employment manager. And I, I'm going to offer James the job of leadership. And you two are going to be a two person team for 500 team members to start out with. Yeah. Very cool opportunity. And, Kudos to him for, you know, seeing that in both of us, that we had that shared vision and a lot of our fundamentals were the same. I kind of (laughs) forgot about Culture Club. I'm not going to (laughs) lie. I did. I I just Uh like, yeah, we had meetings, mutual meetings. It was like, no, it was it was a club to talk about culture and (laughs) I think at work. Yeah. Yeah, Culture at work. Yeah. yeah. And I get what was interesting. The roles that we were in at that time, Mm -hmm. uh, I was an instructor, a trainer within the leadership and talent development team then. And um just the progression that took off from that from that moment from just uh, again a mutual friend reaching out to us and say like hey let's let's connect for a little while and um yeah i remember i remember getting an email phone call text like hey like i want to talk to you about this this role and the first person i called is like Brittany, like what is what is this and why and all of these things <laughs> and um it was just a really unique opportunity and uh um, I think even at that point, we didn't really know what we had. We were just good colleagues and mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, knew we had shared values. And uh, yeah, so that was that was a big day. And I feel like it took forever. I was mm-hmm. like, so he said it was a thing, but when is it a thing? You know, so he did bug me like daily. Yeah. <laughs> like, text was like, hey, have you heard anything? I was like, and I knew all along, but couldn't necessarily tell him. So I'm like, it's coming. Right. <laughs> yeah, so, so is that how you guys became friends in through culture club or did it start before that? Everyone would really like that if we told her that she was <laughs> responsible was. for us. I, yeah. I mean, we really didn't know each other before for then. Sure. So yeah. yeah. Uh, there's, so there's friends and then there's, there's best friends. And that's yeah. something that we talked about in our session today and something that um, Gallup that we're going to talk about in a little bit uh, really focuses on too. And, mm-hmm. and there, there is a, there's a difference and one is a little, has a little more risk associated with it. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, you are all my friends now, right? Yeah. Um, and Brittany's my best friend. I hope you guys know that, you know, like <laughs> type of thing. And uh, so I think that uh, 
for us, um, we in our session today we talked about our like our first fight, which was probably <laughs> kind of like the make or break it. Like either this is going to work or it's not, and mm-hmm. it's, it's kind of like childish and kind of fun to talk about and joke about now. But it was it was bad, uh, <laughs> and I think that it was. Um, I think it's what the way that we navigated that, the leadership that we had around us, the the mission that was put in front of us, and our values that were like, no, let's let's talk this conflict out, and from there. Uh, it just, um, from there, it just, the wheels kept spinning and we just kept, uh, finishing each other's sentences senses, <laughs> and like, it just, uh, it just kind of evolved. Um, I, I would say I, I credit a lot of the, the environment and the leadership, uh, that put us in the same place. Proximity, sure. Um, workflows, absolutely. And just the ability to, uh, work off of each other to, to do what they wanted us to accomplish, which was really great so yeah yeah so aside from it being fun to have a friend which i think no one would argue with that right most normal people (laughs) um (laughs) like what's the benefit day to day let's i mean for you guys let's start there like what why is it different going to work when you have a best friend there for you know for james and i specifically and we've talked at length about this just because we are with each other all the time but it's having that person that you can rely on that's much deeper than the surface level, like things are good, but when things are bad, I know that we're shared experience and we have that together Mm -hmm. and that I, I confidently can tell him my true feelings and that he isn't going to tell me what I need to hear Mm -hmm. or what I want to hear. He will tell me what I need to hear. Like Brittany, you're overthinking that, or you're just not being very nice right now. Like (laughs) you're seeing it from such a tunnel visioned level. Let me broaden your horizon to it. We all, we often play devil's advocate with each other. Like it might not be what I think, Mm -hmm. but I'm going to say, James, like think of it this way and then helping each other through that. So that's my favorite thing about it. We do that every day, every day. (laughs) (laughs) You know, it's HR. It's HR. Yeah. (laughs) It's, Mm -hmm. it's those moments for sure that definitely like, uh, you, you don't, necessarily get to have with everyone um but to like you know we have a shared office wall and so like hey Brittany, i need to send out this email can you read it real quick like judge free and she's like i don't james your sentence didn't make any (laughs) sense like i mean yeah you know (laughs) so there's like those little things um accountability is a big piece of it um and it's just it's just supporting somebody and you know that uh how many i'm trying to think of like how many Brittany, what are you doing right now she's like i'm super busy but what what do you need <laughs> you know i need a walk uh, I, okay. yeah <laughs> and we'll just uh yeah it's just always having that person that's there for you and i think it's just different because again you can have a friend that's there and then they can do some of those things but uh best friend uh with shared experiences growing up together in this place it's just um yeah, I guess I, I wish more people had that opportunity mm-hmm. yeah and what about benefit to the organization i mean Maybe we're getting a little bit here into like segueing into the research, but what what do you think for your organization mm-hmm. is the benefit that you've seen? And then why don't you just you just take us there? Like, sure. what has Gallup found? What have other folks found to be true about friends friendship at work? Can I share what Sam shared in yeah, our session? So our, one of our executive directors was in our session today, and mm. he said, "I learned a long time ago that if I need something." done by my team that he's also going to CC James on it because he knows that the two of us work collectively and that anything that I do is then going to transpire into his world. And so I, that was like a light bulb moment for me. I didn't even Mm -hmm. think about that. Like we just work so well and um, so closely with each other that our, now our leadership teams are starting to notice that. And Mm -hmm. before I think it was seen as like, why are they together all the time Mm -hmm. when they're completely separate? But now people are understanding that we do really good work together and yeah. why not make that a together thing? And, and in this case, you have the added benefit of your roles actually playing different roles on, this, on the continuum of an employee's life cycle mm-hmm. yeah. with you in recruitment and hiring yeah. the individual, James working on talent development and leadership development um, and developing those um, team members into leaders. Yeah. So. Like it's, it's a cool, like yes, they're separate departments and they have an impact on the whole team member experience. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I think for folks listening, like don't, don't hear, oh, these people are both in people services or HR. So like, yeah, of course they have to work together. I mean, 
we run into things where when everywhere there's a really strong relationship, mm-hmm. I mean, it might be food and beverage and security, right? Mm-hmm. Things that on the surface, you might say like, well, yeah, maybe they have to talk once a week and coordinate or whatever. Anywhere there's that super strong relationship, like collaboration, creativity, new processes, things that add immense value, like mm-hmm. that's where they're born. Mm-hmm. And I think for a lot of the reasons you all are saying, like, you can question each other. You can brainstorm together. You can bring a half-baked idea. And some of them are probably crap. And some of them are probably <laughs> amazing. <laughs> but they would never even make it to the table if you didn't have that trust already. So yes. um, I just want to make sure that folks aren't like, oh, yeah, you know, they're a team, right? right. Well, not necessarily. Like, you both have your own deliverables mm-hmm. as well that I'm sure you're you're managing to. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Well said. Okay, so what does the science say? Like, what do we know is best practice? Uh, so from the top, no. Uh, there's, <laughs> there was some interesting data that came out in a 2018. So Gallup, again, is our, our major resource that we have been using for this. There's other really great resources out there as well. And um, we first started this journey for our internal leadership conference. We wanted to share this information with our leaders. And um, I, I believe it was one of the most well-attended sessions we had at our conference. And um, it was cool to see other people in light bulbs. Brittany created a lot of light bulb moments mm-hmm. uh, in that session the the ma- the biggest takeaway and this is a stat that wasn't updated in the 2022 report but a a person who in their survey said that they have a best friend at work uh was seven times more likely to be engaged in their workforce mm. now like there's a lot to unpack in there well, you know what is engagement and what is that you know uh employee and value to the organization and there's a lot of little things in there uh but that number was staggering to me seven times more likely to be engaged and um you know when when we start talking about uh retention and uh acquiring talent uh that is that is a huge lift right and yep. Um, getting people in the door is one thing, but getting people in the door and having them stay because they feel uh, like they belong and that they're engaged, that's uh, that's something that I would double down on all day. Mm-hmm. Um, and so for us, what we really took away from the research and the stats was that, that you have to be intentional. You mm-hmm. have to create pathways and opportunities and a language that supports a healthy friendship culture. Um, and there's again, a lot of uh, really good stats in here. Um, there's some kind of like quirky ones that, uh, we, we <laughs> joked about a little bit in our, our session today, but, um, my favorite is the healthy diet one. If, yeah. if you, you, your friend has a healthy <laughs> diet, you are five times more likely to have a healthy diet, right? Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to guess it goes the other way too, right? Like, uh, you know, from Brittany, we're off our diet this week. Well, it's just going yeah, down. There's actual data that yeah. says if, if your friends are obese, you are mm-hmm. that many times You're more comfortable, more likely yeah. to be obese as well. Yes. yes. Yeah. So there's, there's other like personal development stuff that's in there too. And, sure. um, you know, it, if only my productivity and my work like was, going great because I had a best friend at work, that would be stellar, but like Brittany makes me a better person too, mm-hmm. right? So there's uh, there's the personal aspect mm-hmm. of it and accountability and our families are close and um, conflict and, and all that stuff. Like we can have those conversations, it's really great. So um, back to the stats more so, this one was, I, I think is one of my favorites. Uh, so this was done in 2019, 2021 and 2022. Uh, but the 2022 stats are that if you have a best friend at work, you are two times less likely, let's see if we say that right, two times less likely to be looking or watching the, for the job market, looking for other uh, opportunities. And I'm like, hmm. wow, like, yeah. <laughs> like that is a direct tangible for someone like Brittany and her team. Yeah. Um, and, and for our team, like, that very much impacts the workload that she has. If we can come up with creative ways for for people to feel uh, belonging and included right out of the gate, mm. and so we're doing some pretty intentional things um, that we can share about later when we start getting into like practical things you can do. But um, two times, like I'd be happy if we can get two weeks out of the, a team member, you know, just mm-hmm. to make them you know feel like they belong for two weeks longer. Because right now the markets are crazy. Like yeah. people are, yeah. I liked it for a day, and you know I don't like it anymore. You know, <laughs> so uh, it's those are key stats that are really big pillars for us. Yeah, and so just to make sure that I understand and listeners understand the the stat a little bit better, 
So what I hear you saying is that out of 100 team members, let's say at any given time, 20 people are keeping their eye on job openings, Mm -hmm. right? But if we have a friendship culture that we've developed and those 100 people all have close friendships or best friends at work, well, only 10 people are looking for jobs at any given time. Yep. I mean, that's huge kind of financial return for the company, right? That's a, a real measurable um, benefit. So yeah, pretty amazing. I, I think so, which is why we're like, why, why aren't more people not talking about this? Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I haven't seen a lot of other research, um, you know, published in a major way like Gallup is doing and they're doing like leading work in all of their surveys. Um, do you have a best friend at work is not something that we see in a lot of other surveying mm-hmm. tools, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, It's a big deal. (laughs) Yeah, it's interesting because we do use that question in a lot of our engagement surveys that that we use with clients. And we sometimes do get pushback from leaders on on that specific phrasing of that question. Do you have a best friend at work? And, And so I'd love to just kind of explore why do people feel uncomfortable with that, right? And and my sense is sometimes it's because they're afraid of you know nepotism or favoritism yes. and so they are intentionally not encouraging quote unquote best friends yeah. or you know we use NPS net promoter score mm-hmm. um, questions as well where it's like would you actively promote this company you know would you talk about it favorably invite your friends and family to work there and people take it very literally and they're like, no, we shouldn't be hiring family or our friends. Right. And, and so why do you think people feel uncomfortable with that? It's archaic in my opinion. I think Mm -hmm. it's, you know, especially with this new generation entering the workforce, Mm -hmm. they're, they're pushing us. They are challenging what we are all used to time immemorial, right? Like it's very rigid and, they are going to make us better leaders. Mm -hmm. And I I think it just goes back to that. We heard from a lady after our session today and she was sharing that her leader, um, anytime that they're having like a private discussion and they hear their leader's heels coming down the hallway, they will all scatter. Mm. And she said, she's just, she's not good to us. And I said, have you ever tried to include her? Mm. Because it's exactly what you said about that not feeling included or I'm not a part of this, so you shouldn't have that. Um, And so include her. There's yeah. nothing that's so old school to say, like, you can't be friends with your subordinates. Mm-hmm. You have to be able to draw that line and have mm-hmm. boundaries. Boundaries are so healthy in every aspect of our lives, but especially there. Yeah. It can be done. It can be done. Mm-hmm. You can be friends with mm-hmm. boundaries. Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, and it's very convenient that we have a director of talent acquisition here with us. <laughs> but tell me about kind of efficacy or the effectiveness of referral programs. Mm-hmm. And I, mean, I think there's a lot of data out there around that that would also encourage us to yes. say, hey, the more people's friends that they refer, like yes. way better off the organization is going to be. Yes. I mean, we have a referral program. So um, if you refer your friend and they make it 30 days, they get $300. If they make it 90 days, they get another $300, both of them. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's a mutual accountability oh, so it's not just the refer right? it's also the friend that got referred correct so nice. and we have seen huge benefits from it and i wish i had numbers to share but we have seen a very big return on it and you know someone in our session this morning what did he he went to denny's for breakfast mm-hmm. and the the servers had shirts that said now hiring you and your bestie you and your bestie oh. so it's wow. proven love yeah. it right? this, yeah. denny's is working with gallup that's, yeah. Yeah. That's my yeah. take away. <laughs> They're in their yeah. pocket. <laughs> <laughs> so it, we, we have seen extreme ex- success from it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And just to give listeners a little bit more context, whenever um, James is sharing about this data from Gallup, it's not just that it's a predictor of engagement. It's one of the top 12. Yeah. Like imagine any questions you can ask. Mm-hmm. Imagine 10,000 questions. Yeah. One of the top 12 that would be a antecedent or positively correlated with engagement would be this question. Do you have a best friend at work? And so, yeah, when we do get pushed back around it, it's like, well, 
We can even either ask a question that makes a big difference or we can ask a question that doesn't. Right. Yeah. Right. So we know this makes a big difference. Is there really a good reason for us not to measure it and mm-hmm. ask it? So mm-hmm. great. So tell me about like I'm a leader. I'm listening. Maybe I have a little bit of uncomfortableness sure. with this, but like I'm I'm listening. I'm gonna buy in. Like I believe that you're not making up all these numbers. So what what would I do? Um, to create a culture of friendship, um, let's just start kind of at the department level or on mm-hmm. my work team. Yep. Maybe I'm a supervisor and I have five or six folks that I'm responsible for. Um, what what behaviors could I try on and practice to sure. that might move the needle? Great question. Uh, I do think that it's important to recognize that it's it's different at different levels. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had an individual in our session today that said, "Hey, at, at the executive level, it, it can get a little lonely." Yeah. Um, and at the leadership level, you have people that you're overseeing. You have more of an active role in trying to cultivate, you know, uh, a, a culture in which there's friendships. And then, uh, so so to your question, what what kind of thing can we be intentional about? Uh, I think the biggest one for me is, is creating opportunities. Mm-hmm. And those can come in all shapes and sizes and uh, different value. And like some can be very expensive and some could be not so expensive. It's, it's really about how, how you approach um, your, your team. And it's mm-hmm. going to be different too. Like if you have a overly large team or a relatively small team, I have about 10 team members on, on my, uh, my team. And uh, I was joking with them like, hey, what would happen if I said, you guys can't go to lunch together anymore. You have to stagger your lunches so that there's somebody (laughs) in the office areas at all times, which all of them are like, you're crazy. We'll all walk right now. (laughs) But I, but I also think like that, that is happening in operational roles, Mm -hmm. right? Like we are doing things intentionally to not allow for those types of connections to happen. And so I would encourage uh, leaders to really think about what, is there anything that I'm doing that's preventing it before Mm -hmm. I start diving in on how do I, how do I create friendships? Um, And I, Somebody in our session said, people need people. And I yeah. thought that was a cool, I'm going to make a cup and t-shirts and everyone's going to get them. People need <laughs> yeah. people. Yeah. And if you allow for the right environment, like those friendships will happen. And that's mm-hmm. what uh, Brittany and my leaders did for us is they put us in a room and said, go do great things. And we did. And I, I think we just need to be thinking about that at a larger scale within our organizations, removing those barriers from uh, keeping people from being with other people. And uh, so that'd be, that would be the first thing is just intentional uh, creating opportunities. The other big one is uh, verbally and like very in big ways giving permission for that to happen. Mm. Yeah, uh, we um, we are fortunate that our our bosses uh, modeled that for us. They mm-hmm. showed really great friendship between the two of them. We we had a couple of bosses that oversaw us, and um, they they modeled like what was this is standard, like and it's yeah. special, and we want that for you. And um, they had outings for all of us, um, you know, paint nights and, you know, uh, I don't know, we did a whole bunch of stuff, yeah. but it, they, they helped cultivate that for us. And, and you might not be able to do that with, you know, 80 people on your team, mm-hmm. but, uh, there, there's other things you can do setting mm-hmm. up, uh, impromptu lunches or bringing in pizza or scheduling something after hours that, um, you don't even have to like pay for it. You're just like, Hey, like just letting everyone know, like Thursday, everyone's going and doing this thing. And if anyone wants to go, that's cool, you know, and people will go and those things will happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, in our session, people shared about, um, uh, like incentives or gift baskets or like something that's unique to that person and that person. And, and uh, what did they say? Like sports jerseys and everyone's wearing a sports jersey. And all of a sudden I know that you're a Seattle Seahawks fan or you're an Oakland Raiders fan or whatever. Mm-hmm. And there's a connection that's being made there. And so that those are things that are giving permission from those, those mm-hmm. leaders. Um, and more often than not, I, I think uh, we are, we're, shooting ourselves in the foot by some archaic practices like Brittany was sharing um, that prevent us from doing those, those types of things. Yeah. And, you know, just hearing you talk through that, the theme that I'm hearing emerge is creating places where we talk about more than tasks. Mm -hmm. Cause I'm just thinking like, if you guys weren't put on that culture committee together, like I imagine a culture committee, like that's a place where you learn what the other people value yes. yeah. and you're having conversations about like some kind of difficult and 
who are we going to be and who do we want to become and who are we really at our core? Mm -hmm. How does this department fit into that? And this one, you know, so it's a place where like there's real kind of authenticity required to be able to get anything done. And not everyone can go be a part of a culture committee, right? Right. I'm not saying that that's practical, but I do think, yeah, hearing like we don't just talk about tasks. Mm -hmm. We are a place where we ask how people are doing where we let people have chit chat, where yes. we, we encourage people to connect and talk about their families and their hobbies and who they are and what they do. And um, I am curious, like how have you seen that encoded through processes, through recurring practices? Um, maybe it's uh, a part of onboarding programs uh, where we're talking about more than what's written on my resume. Sure. Like what are, what are the kinds of ways that, um, you think an organization like really creates a system for friendship to happen. And by no means are we perfect, right? I mean, yeah, sure. we're work in still very work in progress. Yeah, <laughs> very work in progress. But I, I think it starts exactly with what you were just talking about. People aren't cogs in the wheels. They're individuals. Mm-hmm. And the more we can celebrate individuality and, you know, our core purpose at Northern Quest is we make people feel special. And that is so simple because it can be applied throughout anything, right? And so yeah. I think it's starting with, A, treating people as people and recognizing that what's important to James isn't necessarily what's important to me, but I value it because it's important to him. Mm -hmm. And then applying something simple that everybody can relate to and everybody knowing that mission. So what is the, so we talked about this a little bit earlier, but there's a difference between having a friend at work and having a best friend at work. There's a difference between being friends Mm -hmm. and being best friends. Mm -hmm. And when we talked about that survey question earlier, that's often what the trigger is when people push back on the question is like, well, yeah, we're all friends here, but I don't know that we should, uh, I mean, I don't know that people would even want to have their best friend at work, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I'm, curious to just pull a little bit more of that thread of like, what are those levels of friendship Mm -hmm. and what, you know, what are some of the things back to, you know, what can we do to kind of deepen those friendships? Great question. Uh, The stat that jumped into my head as you asked that was that uh, according to Gallup, two out of 10 people that they've surveyed actually said that they had a best friend, which Mm -hmm. like super saddens me. But I, I would, I would venture to guess that if it had just said, do you have a friend at work? That number would be a lot higher. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think potentially a, a a lesser correlation with uh, things like engagement and productivity and safety and things like that. And so I, I feel like that best friend has to be there because it's an elevated relationship beyond just a friend. Yeah. Um, I, I have, I have lots of friends, right? Mm-hmm. Like, and, mm-hmm. um, a friend to me Two is Two more just, as of right. Yeah. Right. Somebody, yeah. I, you yeah. know, a stranger Three. in line. Three. Is about to be. We're not going to forget about Ben uh-huh. with the headphones on. Okay. But my, my best friend knows about my inner workings, the things that trigger me, the things that excite me, the things that, um, make me return to work the next day. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, uh, um, you know, uh, I, I think this is, this is gonna not sound great in some situations. And I, I'd be curious if some listeners feel like this is kind of like irking them a little bit and I'd venture that they should reflect on that a little bit. But, uh, I think we are moving away from our workforce solely being loyal to our organizations mm-hmm. and being loyal, more loyal to the people to their left and to their right. Yeah. And if they can say that person is their best friend, they will show up to work more often. Yeah. Like, I just, I believe that. And um, some people I'm sure are like, what do you mean they're not loyal to the organizations? Like, yeah. <laughs> we have specific practices that are preventing that from happening. Yeah. And uh, I, I just think the best friend role is something that needs to be reserved for um, that, that relationship that really is driving performance and productivity and healthy culture and all of the other things that go along that Gallup has said it is. Yeah, and... What if loyalty, that is where loyalty starts? And so if we look at loyalty to an organization, what actually causes that? 
this research might suggest that the reason people are loyal to organizations is because they're loyal to each other. Mm -hmm. They're loyal to their friends at work and more importantly, their best friend at work. Yes. Um, and that would jive with research that, um, I recently read a phenomenal book, um, Humankind, A Brief History. And, uh, we talked about it on another episode, but it, um, there are studies from World War I, um, actually both world wars, but looking at why were the Germans so effective mm -hmm. at warfare. Mm -hmm. And we all know, you know, the effects of both of those wars, right? Mm -hmm. But why did they fight? Right. And why were they so good? It wasn't because they were fighting for the ideology it wasn't because they were fighting for Nazism or, you know, any um, any cause. Mm -hmm. They fought for each other. Mm -hmm. yeah. They fought for their fellow soldiers that were in the trenches yes. in a pretty horrible situation with them. And that's why they fought. Yeah. That is, you know, what when, when you go back and look at both data, personal correspondence, stories that people tell afterwards it tells a very very different picture agreed and it was and and so you when you turn that on its head and you look at okay you know how do we get people to really rally and engage with this work well it's because of who they care about yeah. right and mm -hmm. so just a personal experience for me as, and I would say everybody, we have a small team and everybody on my team is my friend, right? Yeah. As Luke and I have started traveling more together, working on more projects together, um, he comes to Montana once a month now. And initially for practical reasons, he comes and stays at our house when he is there. And so through all of those shared experiences, our friendship has deepened. And I believe that we work more effectively together now yes. because we're better friends. And that means we can have more honest conversations. Yes. There's more truth. There was a situation that came up recently where we had a conversation in my kitchen early in the morning before leaving to go to our clients. And Luke said, this is what happened yesterday. And I said, I feel very blindsided by that. And I had kind of an emotional reaction because of something that I wasn't, hadn't expected, yes. right? But because of that level of relationship, we were able to just have that conversation, be very honest, and create a better shared understanding of the situation and how we would move forward. Yeah. And that would not have happened, I, yeah. I believe, if we hadn't developed that level of friendship where I... You know, we care for each other as people and, and what's important to him is important to me and what's important to me is important to him. And we can have that level of trust, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Yeah, and real practically, I mean, just the other day, I mean, you noticed it was maybe my affect during a meeting that I didn't even notice. Mm -hmm. And like in the background, I was like, had like some physical thing going on and you know, had a thing going on at home that I was just trying to manage. Yeah. And, you know, I get a text from Hannah, like during the meeting, like, Hey, are you okay? Yeah. And I was like, Oh, well maybe I should reflect on that. Cause I'm just like in the zone getting work done. Like I will power through <laughs> this meeting will be over and we'll be fine. Um, but like her calling, seeing it before I was even aware really and calling it out, like helps me perform better. So there's some real like... And that was even a Zoom meeting, right? right. Oh, but wow. because yeah. we've spent so much time together yes. in real time, I can see when he's like not fully there. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. So um, yeah, I think this performance enhancing aspect of friendship, like when people get squeamish about it, like yeah. they need to anchor to that. Mm -hmm. And then I'll say this, like I have a little bit of a hypothesis I think when we get pushback about talking about friendship at work, I think oftentimes it's because people say, well, at work we have to do things that are unpleasant yeah, and um, things that like don't really mesh well with friendship. And when they say that, I think that's code for I have to behave in ways that don't align with my core values when I'm at work. Yeah. And my encouragement would be if that is the case, 
rather than saying, well, I don't have a real friendship or real relationships or relationships that require vulnerability and authenticity, because here sometimes I just have to do some shit work from time to time that makes other people feel bad, that makes me feel bad, but I have to do it to be able to hit the numbers or to get things done or whatever. Like that's the real conversation to have. Let's not lose this ability for friendship to make us all go further faster just because we don't want to say, Hey, like I have, there's some issues with how we're doing business that we need to talk about. And if there are things that are threatening my personal values, well, well, if we want to be a successful organization, we're going to address those, right? Because those are also going to be things that are really going to impact levels of engagement Mm -hmm. and tenure and, and all of the pieces. So, okay. So, Final thoughts, key takeaways. We usually like to end with that. Mm-hmm. So, Hannah, what are you thinking? What are your takeaways from the conversation? Yeah, I've always had a hunch and also some data to support that friendship at work is important. And to some extent, I've always tried to create those um, environments uh, in places I've worked and programs I've developed. And, and I really appreciate you guys being here and kind of bringing that conversation to the surface and, and having this explicit conversation about why it matters, why it's important. You know, we talk a lot about um, human connection and creating mm-hmm. community and a sense of community. And a big part of community is friendship. Yes. And so, um, yeah, for me, a big takeaway is organizations can be intentional about creating and it's not like this is not about forcing people to be friends and you don't have to be friends with everyone at work. However, what we can do is create an environment in which friendship can flourish. Mm -hmm. And that I think is the big takeaway for me. Like it. Brittany, how about you? Takeaways? (laughs) Or, or recommendations, you know, for how leaders can, do this. I just love top, talking about this topic. It's just purpose, right? Mm-hmm. Um, humans by design need connection. Yep. And if we can help people find their connection, even the introverts of the world, you know, mm-hmm. I, I, everybody has somebody um, that they can rely on. And it just it just makes the world a better place. I know that sounds cliche or <laughs> naive, <laughs> but I, I truly believe in that. James? Uh, practical takeaway for, for your listeners um, if, if you, if you think that this is just going to be an overwhelming challenge to try to like reinvent your culture, to be a friendship culture, uh, please, please don't try to take that on as your, as your own like challenge, right? Like it's a big <laughs> lift and there has to be a lot of people that, that understand or that are all in on that. Um, but what I, what I would encourage, uh, leaders to do is to, to ask a few questions and make a few observations and, I shared earlier, like what, what are you doing to get in your own way? Uh, and then what can you do? Just little things, free things, whatever it is to, uh, spark a a connection as early on as you possibly can in a, uh, new employees experience in your organization, the sooner, the better. Um, cause if they're spinning their wheels two, three weeks in and they're not feeling the love from the rest of the team, they're not feeling connected. They're already looking and, (laughs) and, that doubles down the work that Brittany's doing, which doubled down the work that I'm doing, that doubles down the work of all of that leadership um, when all you had to do was connect them with somebody um, that has a, a mutual value, a mutual skill, a mutual um, just something that's important to them. And so uh, whatever, it doesn't have to be big, just something small that you can connect your, your new workforce that's joining your team um, so they feel like they belong and they feel included. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to jump on that for... Uh, my first takeaway, which is um, just to get practical, we've seen uh, and kind of been along the journey with one of our clients where they created a whole onboarding role Mm -hmm. that's just a socialization role. Mm -hmm. So you have your onboarding into the organization, policy, procedure, fill out your paperwork, whatever else, departmental onboarding, which is where a lot of folks other also have, you know, resource, Mm -hmm. who's our departmental onboarding coordinator when they come in, their shift supervisor, whatever, have a checklist. But then there's this third role, which um, they're on a river in Oregon. And so they call this role the river guide. And their goal really is like, hey, here's the employee dining room. And here's where so-and-so likes to hang out and eat lunch. And 
here's how other people think about how they get their schedule right so that it works for them and their family. Oh, it's been awesome getting to talk to you here. Do you know Brittany? Right. I think that would be someone that you would really connect with. And that uh, they call them the river guide. And that onboarding role is just around making meaningful human connection and soaking the culture of the organization uh, into that person. So they really understand innately, you know, what it means to be there and, and have meeting relationships there. And then the other big key takeaway for me is uh, you talking about like leadership being lonely and that that loneliness can kind of trickle down to folks on their team. And I think that's a great call out. Um, I think there are a lot of folks on senior leadership teams, a lot of executives out there that kind of, you know, kind of wrinkle their, their, their brow furrows a little bit when they Mm -hmm. talk about friendship at work because they're not getting it. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, whatever pressures, maybe they grew up in a time that that wasn't a normal thing, or maybe they've just been a high performer their whole life and haven't connected with the folks alongside them. I think being aware of that as a senior leader and making sure that you're not trickling it down and you are providing a place for meaningful relationships, that's a million dollar idea to make sure like, Hey, leaders make that change tomorrow. Let people connect in meaningful ways. And man, we all hope one day you can find that too, right? Find Mm -hmm. that community. Well, Thank you so much for joining. Thank you. How do yeah, people you. find you? How do they get a hold of you? If they want to reach out, how do they do that? LinkedIn. Yeah, I'm <laughs> yeah. a LinkedIn yeah, junkie. LinkedIn. Yeah, yeah, I like to post stuff there. That'd be the easiest way, right? Pretty directly. Um, I guess I can't hand out my business card over a podcast. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, that, that'd be the easiest way for me and for Brittany to collaborate on stuff like that. But we awesome. we just want to share the message. And, you know, it's uh, there's always more information and we're always doing more to try to make it work in our organization. So we're going to learn more stuff, too, that we want to share with people at future events that we're invited to. Yeah. That's wonderful. Um, it's been such a great conversation. Thank you so much for being here today, Brittany and James. Thank, Thank you, you for having us. Yeah. Yes. And Hannah, how do people find us? Uh, Purposeandperformancegroup.com. Uh, check out our uh, website and then uh, on social media. We're mostly on LinkedIn and you can also find us on Facebook. And thank you so much for joining us. Uh, let's all go out there and make some friends. Yeah. 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 All right. Make some friends. <laughs> Deal. Thank you. <laughs> Magic in the Room is hosted by Chris Province, Anna Bratteru, and Luke Freeman. And produced by Ben West. Theme music is by Evan Grimm. Title track, Fake Love, available on Apple Music. And this podcast was recorded at Story Catcher Studio with video and audio editing and production support by Brad O'Hara and Alicia Crum. With inspiration, strategy, and technical support by yours truly. Neil Hughes. Magic in the Room is a production of Purpose and Performance Group. You can find us at purposeandperformancegroup.com and remember, previous episodes are available at magicintheroom.com.